So welcome to another episode of Money Moves. This is our Spaces series we've been hosting for about a year. I think this is episode nine about all things institutions, on-chain finance, and tokenization. So we got an interesting guest with us today from Clearpool. So let's uh, jump into it, and I know more people will be joining as we go along. Jacob, if you want to give us a quick introduction on yourself and on Clearpool, and then we'll go from there. Yeah. Um, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, so my, my, just quickly about myself. I am, um, so Jacob based in, in Hong Kong. So I live here in Asia since about eight and a half years and originally from, from Italy. Actually, my background is I, um, I worked mainly in startups. So I was, um, you know, involved in, in, in launching a few sort of consumer marketplaces, um, in, in Asia from the very beginning all the way to IPO. So I was, Sort of like one of the earlier guys for um, the largest food delivery company in Asia, uh, I guess outside of China, and and then later I went into fintech, where I was the commercial director of a digital bank and, and lending player in Southeast Asia. Um, you know, we did all all to, all sort of you know lending in in Vietnam, Indonesia, Thailand, those kind of places, and we served basically everyone that was left out by 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 the traditional banks. Um, you know, we, we, we sort of, um, cater to startups. We cater to, um, you know, online sellers like, like, like Amazon sellers, but, but from, you know, the region where we have different marketplaces all the way to, you know, small mom and pop shops. Um, and I guess, you know, my, my personal journey in crypto is that, um, you know, in 2017, you know, I bought the first, my first Bitcoin, Ethereum, a couple of other tokens. I guess I, um, came in right at the top. Of that cycle. So, 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 so when the bear market hit, you know, I wasn't really particularly involved, but I got again very involved when DeFi started. So DeFi summer, that was, yeah, I guess summer 2020. Um, so I was doing alternative lending in, in, in my, you know, um, in my, in my job, basically at my startup. And, and that is, you know, when I for the first time really realized, you know, all the different opportunities that, that crypto actually has and, especially DeFi and, 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 you know, I was quite amazed by, especially the, I guess the OG DeFi protocol, especially the lending ones such as, you know, Maker, Aave and Compound. And, and it, it was then also that I met my co-founders. Uh, my co-founders, they have, um, you know, one of them has a TradFi background, worked in capital markets his whole life. And the other one is, um, his name is Alessio. He's the CEO of Hextrust, um, a major custodian uh, based out of Asia. And, you know, I was talking with those, I was talking with them and, you know, we realized that there was a, a gap in the market while obviously, you know, the regular sort of large over collateralized uh, lending protocols such as Compound Abe, they obviously worked really well. Um, but, you know, we realized that something like, you know, private credit is, is missing, right? Like for, for, for Aave and Compound, you obviously need to post um, more collateral than the loan that you actually take on. And, um, you know, while that is obviously being very safe and it works really well, um, we realized that it wouldn't really work for, um, you know, all type of borrowers and it would also be capital inefficient. This is why we came up with Clearpool. So Clearpool is a DeFi credit marketplace um, where basically there is uh, four institutions. So instead of the on-chain collateral, um, what we're doing is we're having legal agreements, we're doing credit risk assessments, um, and, you know, we're implementing other risk mitigation measures. Um, and then, um, you know, those, those companies, those institutions, they can open lending pools and those lending pools can then be funded by anyone in, um, in DeFi. We have both permissionless and permission pools. We are running since about two and a half years and so far have originated nearly 500 million US dollars in loans. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for that great intro. And um, it sounds like there's already a lot of great things happening. And I think your background really plays into this conversation. So yeah, excited to have you and, and welcome. And Morgan, I'll let you uh, give a quick intro and then take it away from there. Sure. Thanks, Kyle. Um, hey, guys, I'm uh, Morgan Krupetsky. I lead institutional and capital markets uh, business development at Avalabs. I think like Kyle mentioned, um, you know, this is about our ninth uh episode of Money Moves. And uh, maybe just to level set, I think, you know, the kind of motivation behind why we kicked off this space is just for those who might be new to listening in. 
um, is really to kind of obviously feature different protocols and partners that are building on or within the avalanche ecosystem, but really kind of offer a um, a space for for you know different types of um, kind of community members and participants to come in and ask really accessible questions, ways to make the um, kind of the scary topic of whether it's DeFi or on-chain finance or tokenization much more accessible. Um, so through me, I think I'll, you know, I, I always try to ask things that are like very kind of, you know, basic, because um, I think a lot of us in this space just take for granted that everyone's on the same page in terms of knowing what all these terms means, knowing what tokenization is, knowing what um, kind of like the implications and ins and outs of it are, but it's really kind of to use this time to be able to make the topic much more accessible and really kind of get down to the, so what, like, why is this important or relevant for, for you, for me? Um, and, and what does this mean? And, and kind of putting it into those terms and, and really, again, making it more accessible. So with that, I know, Jacob, you went through um, kind of some of the high level in terms of obviously your background and, and kind of what, what led you to, to, to launch Clearpool. Um, I'd love to get a sense, maybe just to kick off, um, you know, you mentioned your, your background um, throughout parts of Asia and particularly in kind of catering to those, um, those vendors or companies who may not have like traditional access to like the capital markets. From your perspective in terms of um, that experience versus kind of the on-chain experience, what do you feel like, um, Clearpool is kind of like setting out to solve? Um, and, and why do you think potentially it might be a better, more superior solution than some of the work that you were doing before on the fintech side of things, where it sounds like the end um, like beneficiary is similar? But I'd love to kind of get your, your take, especially since you kind of had the experience in both worlds. Like, what do you think or how do you think potentially Clearpool or, or on-chain solutions might be, might be superior? And, and what are some of the problems that they're setting out to solve? Yeah, thanks. So uh, I guess you know, in a way, even though it's 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 different, it, it there you know there's definitely similarities. Um, you know, even for Clearpool, you know, our main um, borrower borrower type right now is still trading firms. Um, it's a lot of the sort of crypto native um, market makers, and you know, although I wouldn't really um, compare them with you know small uh, small small firms in in Indonesia. Um, they have one thing in common, which is that they also not really serve by, you know, traditional banks. Um, so I guess, I guess also there, you know, we sort of like provided a financing opportunity or we provided financing opportunities, um, for those type of players that, you know, sometimes obviously have strong balance sheets and are very credit worthy, but they're not really interacting with, um, traditional banks. The other thing, you know, that, that we wanted to do at Clearpool is we wanted to, you know, allow, everyone basically because that's really what DeFi can do right no matter you know where you are and, and, and no matter whether you have you know access to you know banking rails uh, etc et everyone can come to our marketplace um, and can see you know all these different credit opportunities um, people can then you know compare the different opportunities there's a lot of information we have uh, ratings we have reports um, and then they can, you know, choose to potentially invest into one of those credit opportunities um, and then, you know, earning a, a stable um, interest rate. Um, so, so this is really something that, you know, we were going, we, we wanted to bring to DeFi, basically access um, to this type of opportunities for everyone. Because like another thing is, you know, if you would like to, you know, um, finance one of those companies, if you would like to lend to one of those companies, usually you would have to be at least a you know high net worth individual. It would have to be like a significant um, size of of cash, and and this is something that I think is quite interesting with Clearpool and with other DeFi protocols. Um, you know, no matter how big your check size is, we have you know large institutional lenders, but we also have um, small lenders, and everyone can participate. Um, I guess comparing you know regular fintech um, to 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 DeFi. Uh, you know, a, a lot of it is similar, I would say, right? When it comes to, you know, I mean, even though we are we are a DeFi protocol, we are not completely decentralized, right? Um, we're not completely trustless. Um, obviously, you know, guys like Aven Compound, 
Um, they can be trustless because everything is based on smart contracts, right? You need to provide this much collateral. There's a certain, um, you know, loan to value. And, and if, 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 if your collateral decreases in size, that, that basically in value, it, it, you know, you can just liquidate that position and, and the lender is getting back their money. Um, when it comes to credit, um, you know, it is unfortunately, at least for now, or it might never be really possible to be completely permissionless. Um, because, you know, there, 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 there is, you know, there, there, there needs to be some legal structure in place, um, in order for you to, you know, lend someone money and, and, and obviously expect that money to be returned as well. Uh, this is why, you know, we, we, I, I always, I, I think, you know, we take what is good from, you know, regular, I would say traditional lending or fintech lending. And then we add the on-chain component, uh, and we become a bit of a, you know, DeFi, CeFi mix which I think is the case with a lot of the RWA protocols. Um, I guess, you know, one thing that is interesting for, for DeFi compared to FinTech is uh, transparency. So obviously you are able to see at any point in time um, what's the status of the loan. If there is any delays in uh, repayments, um, that, you know, is being immediately, um, uh, that, that comes out immediately, right? So, so if, if anyone cannot make a repayment in time, um, you know, the whole, uh, basically this is broadcasted to everyone. Everyone can, can see this very often. You know, what happened in the last cycle where, you know, obviously some of the loans in general in DeFi maybe, um, had some issues. Um, you could always immediately see that it was immediately flagged. You would also see it on, on Twitter, et cetera, that maybe, you know, any of the borrowers was, was in trouble. So this transparency, although it does not prevent from, you know, defaults to happen, it, I would say usually, um, it usually results in a better outcome because if there's any problem, it gets immediately flagged and, 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 and you can react, you can cut maybe, you know, if, if there's any losses, the losses usually tend to um, remain smaller because the worst thing is what happened with, you know, the centralized players such as Celsius, BlockFi, et cetera, is that, you know, or FTX for that, for that matter is that, you know, there, there were losses, um, but because it wasn't transparent, um, you know, people try to make up for it. They took additional risks and the losses became bigger and bigger until the hole was, um, was very large and caused, um, you know, a lot of damage. So I think transparency, that's one key. The other key is, um, you know, like li- liquidity in a way, right? Like, like usually, you know, what we see is that in, 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 you know, doing loans in, in fintechs, loans are usually uh, r- relatively larger duration. You know, every time there's a repayment, there's a lot of bureaucratic, um, involvements that, that need to happen. And as a result, usually these loans are, you know, at least for several months or sometimes even longer. Um, I think, you know, with DeFi, you know, there can be interesting, you know, protocol designs that just make the whole, you know, loan origination, but also funding of the loans and repayments of the loans a lot more efficient. And as a result, um, you know, you can, you can raise liquidity much quicker um, as a company um, and at the same time as a lender, you can you can you can you can fund the pool uh, quickly, and you can you can hopefully also get your your funds back. Um, I think you know then there is a lot of um, you know there's a lot of potential I would say around private credit on chain, such as you know maybe secondary trading of 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 of, of your sort of like um, tokenized debt token, the LP tokens. I think those are currently still a little bit theoretical concepts. Yeah, that 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 aren't re- haven't really materialized yet. So the whole composability is 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 a theoretical concept for RWAs right now. I think we're not yet there, but I guess that is something where I think you know there there need to be a lot more innovation and and we need to we need to we need to have a lot. We, we, there's gonna be growth in in that, in that aspect, but I think with the very initial stages only. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's interesting because when we talk about. Um, like real world assets, everyone like jumps to like secondary markets and all this like kind of utility and this whole like robust on-chain ecosystem, which obviously we all, I think, want to get to. But in the first instance, I think there's a lot of work that we as an industry still need to do as it relates to just like initial demand and distribution, which um, obviously you guys are kind of working to um, to cultivate with with in the first instance, permissionless pools and kind of growing it out from there. And then I think we can kind of, um, kind of scale up to that, but that's, that's a good point. Um, I'd love to kind of get a sense, especially since 
Clearpool is kind of a new addition to the Avalanche ecosystem overall. And and I think I think actually Clearpool might be the first um uh like unsecured lending market um on Avalanche. So very excited to have you guys. Um can you for those that are kind of new to the protocol just talk a little bit more about um in the first instance how the permissionless pools work. Um, what might be uh, kind of your selection criteria for the institutional borrowers to kind of tap into these pools? And then we'll get into, I mean, like the featured product, which is definitely the credit vaults. But if you could talk a little bit more about the permissionless pools first, are there investment minimums? Are there like minimum um, kind of time times to, to hold the, the position, holding periods? Um, and maybe before I hand the mic over to you, I would say none of this is financial advice. Please do your own research and, uh, you know, all the all the standard uh, disclaimers. But would love to kind of get a sense from you in terms of how that works, both from a borrower perspective, as well as, you know, people who want to kind of learn more and understand how to actually provide liquidity. Like, what does that look like? Yeah. Um, so so actually the permissionless pool, the, our permissionless product, um, we, we sort of... Um, I think we we are we're changing the term and we're calling it dynamic pools, um, and dynamic in the sense that you know actually those that product can be both permissionless or it can be permissioned, right? So that just really depends on the on the on the borrower. So our protocol allows both for permissionless and permission pools, and 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 that is um, basically just depending on the compliance um, preference and compliance uh, requirements. Of, of the borrower. Now, when we, what is, what is our dynamic pool product? So when we started, um, doing clear pool, we set out to really, we wanted to, to, to create a, you know, private credit product that feels more like DeFi, um, compared to, compared to some of the maybe other, um, you know, um, l- l- private credit, um, lending protocols where you had fixed fixed terms, um, you had fixed interest and you had uh, long lockups. And basically what we came up with is we came up with these uh, pools, which are single borrower pools. So every borrower has their own pool. Um, it's like a marketplace, right? As a user, you can go onto the marketplace and, and, and you can choose which borrower you would like to, to fund to. Um, now, the, the borrowers are all um, institutions, um, mainly trading firms. Actually, for the dynamic pool product, um, what 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 those trading firms, you know, what we do is we obviously we're actually doing KYC uh, as well on their end, and then those trading firms need to sign legal agreements, right? They, they sign a, a master loan agreement, so in the event of a default, there's actually legal recourse, and then um, they need to undergo a credit risk assessment, which is being done um, by you know our close partner Credora. Um, so, you know, just like what, ki- what type of companies are those? Those are usually high frequency trading firms that are adopting, that are, you know, that are doing um, market risk neutral strategies, um, you know, across different exchanges. So, so basically what they do is they, you also call them like, like, like market makers or liquidity providers. They, they basically trade on, on, you know, different exchanges at the same time and, 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 and try to exploit ex- like small price discrepancies. Um, and, and by doing that, they, 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 they're making the markets, you know, more efficient. If that, if that is done in the right way, um, you know, these trading firms are market risk neutral, meaning they don't really take any long uh, exposures, um, and are therefore usually considered, you know, relatively good credit, um, as long as they're, you know, um, as long as they're obviously, um, you know, doing only these type of strategies and as long as they're, um, you know, good sort of like trading firms. And how do we figure that out? Um, you know, we're doing risk assessment by our partner, Credora, as I mentioned. Um, what's happening there is that, um, you know, they're not just looking at financial statements um, or, you know, doing their due diligence and, and, and doing interviews about processes, etc. But these trading firms also need to connect their um, real-time um, trading accounts. So, you know, if they trade on, on Binance, for example, they need to provide API keys. And then um, we're able to see, you know, at any point in time, how many assets they have, you know, across all the different exchanges and, um, you know, whether they're really um, trading uh, in a market neutral way 
um, or whether they're actually taking directional risk. So, so the, the score is then, you know, really a combination of those different uh, factors, right? We look at the financials. Um, we're looking at, they're looking at, um, at, 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 uh, you know, other sort of, um, operational excellence. Um, and then we're looking at real time, um, data. And, 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 and this real time data obviously also means that in case there's anything, any, 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 um, any major mo- changes, this is being flagged. Um, and this is then resulting in a score. So as a bar, in order to open a pool, you would get a score. Um, now how does the, dynamic pools work the dynamic pools work in a way that um that there, there is a utilization curve um and a and and a interest rate um curve so the, the, depending on how much liquidity is being used by the borrower the borrower pays a certain rate the pools are are designed in a way that they're relatively efficient um but at the same time there's always some idle liquidity so if a lender wants to um you know withdraw there is some liquidity for that lender to to um to withdraw um the optimal utilization rate is at roughly 85% meaning at 85% the borrower pays the lowest interest rate if there's more deposits um then the utilization rate will go down a borrower will pay more and the borrower will usually you know borrow more money in order to um move to the optimal point um and pay a lower fee if there is many withdrawals same thing happens. Um, the utilization rate goes towards 100%. Interest rate goes up and, 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 and borrowers need to repay in order to move back to a lower interest rate. Also, there is a mechanism that, um, that basically forces the borrower to repay if the, the pool goes into high utilization. Um, if a borrower does not repay within five days, a borrower actually, um, faces a default. Um, so by, by designing it this way, um, you know, we came up with a, you know, I would say the most liquid, um, you know, private credit, uh, product out there in the market. So there is no, um, there's no lockup periods, um, provided there's funds within the pool. Um, you know, lenders can withdraw at any point in time and the interest rate and utilization mechanism, um, usually always guarantees that uh, liquidity is being provided relatively quickly. Um, we also went with this, you know, single borrower pools, um, because, you know, that, um, so, so we have this single borrower pools at the basis. Um, and that, you know, allows us to really also have some, some composability unlocked. Uh, and this is another, you know, advantage with a uh, permissionless product. So most of those pools with the crypto native trading firms are permissionless. Um, you know, it, it actually means that, you know, we have other protocols that have built products on top of Clearpool. So we have, you know, yield aggregators, um, on top of Clearpool. We have a protocol called IDO Finance. That you know trenched um, every pool into a senior and 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 and, and junior trench depending on the risk preference um, and um, and and yes and, and there's also you know um, products that that allow for diversification so instead of having to fund every single um, you know borrower pool you can choose to invest into a diversified pool that gives you exposure to different borrowers at the same time. That, that last part, I think, is particularly interesting because I think it, you know, you're you're enabling kind of the on-chain primitives um, to kind of exist and then allowing others to kind of build build on top of different products and services, um, which is obviously like one of the big promises of DeFi in the first place. I think that's that's really interesting. And then to your point uh, with the Pandora integration allows a lot of this kind of like real time reporting and transparency that I think you that you referenced earlier on. So between those two things, I think I think those are really interesting and really interesting kind of upgrades uh, compared to like the, the way that, you know, traditional markets and private credit markets work today. Um, can you just talk about I think we haven't mentioned uh, the, the clear pool token itself. Like what is the what is the role of the token as it relates to the protocol um, and and what does that look like? Yeah, so the the uh, the 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 CPool token is the governance token of Clearpool, and it actually you know it actually helps to um, you know sort of secure our you know interest rate um, you know mechanism. So so how it works is um, CPool has a, a critical um, the gov- our governance actually basically decides what rates um, the borrowers are going to end up paying. Because depending on what, 
depending on the, what rating a, a borrower has, they have a different, the, the curve will go up and down. So a borrower that has a top rating would pay a lower interest rate than a, a borrower that has a lower rating. Um, but the sort of, the, the, the actual, um, you know, starting interest rate for the, for the best rated borrower, as well as the, the premium, uh, range is actually being determined by governance. So as a token holder, as a CPOOL token holder, you can stake your CPOOL and, and then you can delegate your CPOOL to so-called clear pool oracles. Um, clear pool oracles are, you know, just a, a variety of different institutions. We have actually some trading firms, some of our large lenders, some of our investors, um, and, and, you know, some other firms such as, um, some other partner companies such as Credora, the, the guys that, that are providing the, the, the ratings or maybe the 11 credit, another company in that space. And, 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 and what happens is that they are voting every two weeks on uh, the interest rates um, of the curves. So every two weeks, um, there is a vote um, and, um, and, 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 uh, and, 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 and basically depending on how many C pool they have staked, um, oracles are then, uh, you know, being, uh, rewarded by taking a share of the, of the token rewards. Um, so, so the, the, the interest rates really move up and down depending on market conditions. Um, and depending on the sort of consent of, of, of the oracle and indirectly of the CPU token holders. Um, and then another, um, another utility of the, of our token is that um, you know, Clearpool, you know, as Clearpool, we, we, um, we earn revenue. Our revenue is a percentage of, uh, the interest rate paid by the borrower. And, uh, actually 50% of the revenue earned is being utilized to buy back the token. So creating a deflationary, um, creating deflationary tokenomics as such. Yeah. Okay. And, um, Let's let's now kind of pivot to the newest product that you guys launched um, initially on Avalanche called the Credit Vaults. Um, can you talk to us about like what motivated the launch of Credit Vaults? What are Credit Vaults? How how are they different potentially than the dynamic pools that you guys have initially been focused on? And then we'll go into kind of you know the, the first instance, but maybe like let's just start out by talking about. You know what are credit vaults in the first place, and and what what motivated the creation? Yeah, I think the, the the main motivation was that you know our dynamic pools work really well, but one of the shortcomings was that they're really just working for those trading firms, right? Because as I mentioned that this like dynamic nature of you know lenders being able to withdraw at any point in time, liquidity is not very sticky. So you know if if lenders want to have their money back, um, basically borrowers need to repay very fast, and and this is something that works well with trading firms um, because, you know, provided they are solvent, they, they are highly liquid, right? They can just like um, unwind their position and make a repayment. Uh, but we realized that it didn't really work for a lot of other type of, a lot of other type of, of borrowers that required liquidity to be a little bit more sticky. Um, you know, some of those are, for example, fintechs, right? If, if you're doing any sort of like receivable financing, um, let's say you're doing invoice financing, then, you know, you as a, as a, as a fintech, you need to finance a invoice. Um, and, 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 you know, the payment terms are, you know, at least 30 days, sometimes they're three months, right? So you, you, you actually need to have those funds for a longer period of time. And at the same time, you know, we, we, we sort of also realized that the, the dynamic product was working really, really well. Um, but because of, you know, the, this liquidity, um, buffer the, 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 the credit, the, the, the interest rates weren't always efficient. So, you know, some of the, some of the interest rate that, that was going to lenders was diluted by, you know, those excess liquidity that had to be kept into the, in, in the walls. And, and, and this is why we came up with uh, credit walls. Credit walls are, um, basically walls that are, you know, um, completely configurable by the borrower. So as a borrower, I can choose my own um, terms and and they can be set up in a very you know uh, liquid uh, short term way such as like you know you can say that you want to have um, you want to pay this much interest rate and you want to have um, you know liquidity uh, liquidity window every two days so if a, if a, if a lender wants to um, you know request a withdrawal you can handle it every two days you can also customize what's the minimum uh, deposit and you can also customize what's the minimum 
notification period. So it's like really a, a product that is very market driven. Um, the borrowers can set up their own rates and they can even adjust um, these terms on the go. So there is some logic that, you know, they can always move it uh, to higher interest rates. If they lower the interest rates, they need to respect a certain buffer in order to protect lenders. Um, but basically it's, it's a product that is very customizable and, um, and, and allows basically all type of borrowers to, to, um, to launch pools, um, on Clearpool. And um, so this is why, you know, we, we, we actually launched the first one. It's called with, with Banksa, which is like a fintech, a payment company. Um, uh, on Avalanche, it, it is a fintech, but at the same time, I think that the interesting part here again is that, um, you know, compared to, I would say all the other, um, you know, fintech credit pools in DeFi, um, again, you know, we focused on, on, on creating something that was very, um, liquid for lenders. So, you know, in, in the first, um, fintech pool that we did with Banksa, um, again, there is a liquidity window every seven days. So if a lender wants to request a withdrawal, um, the borrower, um, can, would, would allow to, to make repayments every seven days, um, which is in stark contrast with a lot of, you know, other, um, products where uh, I guess lockups are, you know, usually in the months, um, sometimes even in the, in the years. Right. Um, that's, I think that's really interesting. I think it's also interesting to note, and we'll, we'll get into banks uh, as well, but that through this product, you're therefore able to kind of service um, a, a different type of borrower and then also eventually kind of um, diversify out into potentially even borrowers that have nothing to do with crypto, which I think from like a diversification perspective, um, it is is interesting to consider as we as we think about like crypto as, as a market versus others. Um, so I think that's really interesting as well. But can we just maybe dive into Bangsa itself a little bit more? Um, how did you guys kind of start working with them? What what do they do? Um, and and I'm sure all this information is available on 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 your um, app. But would love to kind of get a sense from you how that developed. If you could tell us a little bit more about them, um, and then we can go from there. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, we, we always wanted to serve different types of borrowers and um, we always wanted to work with fintechs. Um, but I guess our thesis was when we started working with fintechs, we, you know, we think that, um, you know, in the long run, uh, I personally think that, you know, a lot of those sort of fintech uh, credit opportunities are going to move on chain. Um, but we realized that in the in the short term, it was still not really easy to raise liquidity for this, you know, like receivable financing loans. And one of the reason is that, you know, we realized that the fintechs, as I mentioned, usually those fintech loans were characterized by very long lockups, right? Like half a year or a year, um, which is something that I guess in, you know, regular sort of like traditional credit funds are more comfortable than um, sort of uh, DeFi native um you know um uh, defi native folks and, and even crypto native. natives just like like instant gratification <laughs> exactly right instant gratification and ideally no lockup right this yeah. is why yeah this is why like you know most of exactly this is how how most of the, the crypto uh, you know markets and protocols work right um and, and 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 this is why like okay we we looked at you know who are the different types of um you know, fintechs out there, obviously you have, you know, trade financing, you have invoice financing, which are uh, the, the, the largest sectors, probably those again, you know, very long lockups. So we want to work with those guys, but we, maybe we're going to wait a little bit. So what, what we, what we looked at is a company, companies in the payment space, right? Um, you know, they payment and remittance, uh, space. Um, what, what, what they, what they usually have to do is basically they, they, they require, um, they require, um, you know, very short term. They have very short term liquidity needs. Um, for example, Banksa. Banksa is a company, is a payment firm. Um, they are actually a partner of a lot of the um, exchanges such as Binance, Bybit, etc. Uh, and what they allow is they allow the on and off ramping um, or the on ramping via credit cards mainly. So if you buy um, Bitcoin with a credit card, um, you know, you can buy 1000 US dollars. And, and then they basically immediately, basically usually they immediately credits this 1000 US dollars onto your Binance account. Um, while, you know, in the background, actually it takes, um, as we all know with banks, it takes some time for, for this money to actually uh, settle 
uh, in, in your account if you do any card payments. So, so banks, uh, they basically need to advance, um, you know, this 1000 US, US dollars first. And then it takes usually one day or, you know, if it's a weekend or a public holiday, it might take like three to four days, um, for these funds to actually settle into their, um, into their bank account. So they require some financing. They require a loan basically to finance these bank settlement times. Um, and, 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 and this is actually, um, what the, the, the Clearpool, uh, credit vault is, is financing. So all the funds raised by the Clearpool credit vault are going to be exclusively utilized to, to, for, for them to sort of finance, um, this, this, this bank settlement times. And, and they require these funds in order to scale their operations. Um, and, um, and yeah, so, so this is why, you know, we, we, we thought, okay, uh, companies like Banksa, um, are, you know, an ideal partner because, um, you know, first of all, also they, they, they already very familiar, um, with operating, um, you know, with, with stable coins. So that's also an advantage. Sometimes, you know, more conservative companies, it, 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 it's a bit harder for them to do their on and off ramping, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then at the same time, as I mentioned, you know, those, 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 those financing, uh, times are really just a couple of days. And, and, and this is why we, you know, we set out to really create a product that, you know, although it is a real world, you know, fintech sort of yield, right? Um, at the same time, it, 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 it feels um, a little bit more like DeFi, um, even though, you know, money is, you can't get your money out immediately, um, but you can get your money out in, in, in seven days, which, you know, we think is a, a big improvement um, compared to, you know, the, the, the usual six month or even longer lockups um, that, that, that we were seeing in, in, in this, this space. Yeah. And I think, I mean, to your point, like in terms of um, kind of go to market and how people are thinking about, you know, in the first instance, catering to crypto native borrowers and lenders, I think over time, as we as an industry create um, kind of UIs and, and experiences that are more like web two friendly, I think over time, we'll see people both on the borrowing and lending side going further out, whether it's the risk curve or tenors or things that are more palatable for like the traditional world kind of coming into this space and coming increasingly on chain because, um, you know, again, going back to what we were talking about earlier, you're, you're still able to offer greater transparency um, and, and certain benefits that you just simply can't or don't get in using traditional rails. So you obviously, to your point, should start a little bit more crypto native and even banks are kind of straddling the world of crypto native, but also traditional um, and, and then kind of going out from there. So I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah. Actually, we see, I yeah. think it's quite interesting. I mean, personally, you know, if you really, I mean, if, if we really look at, um, you know, at our industry, I think, I, I would say, you know, stable coins is, is one of the, you know, one, one of the, one of the categories that really achieved sort of like product market fit. Yeah. And, 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 and this is, I'm actually quite, uh, personally very, you know, having done sort of like, you know, fintech, having, having launched, uh, we actually launched, I was, I was in the management of, um, the sort of largest uh, digital bank for businesses in Southeast Asia. And, um, you know, it, once you, once you realize, you know, all the inefficiencies between like cross-border transactions and, 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 you know, how, how inefficient and costly that actually is. Um, you know, I think, you know, fintechs that are operate and have, that have incorporated stable coins. Um, as a, as, as, as a, you know, as, as a way to, to, to make settlements, usually, usually it's cross chain settlements. Um, I think that is a very interesting category and there's a lot of interesting players and we are actually, you know, actively talking with quite a few of them and, and, and we're very, um, interested to work with these guys. So I right. call it, I call it the web 2.5, um, companies, right? Um, I think they, they are interesting. As you mentioned, they are, you know, they are, they are actually, I mean, the business model is still, you know, I mean, it's still not really, you know, it's, it's, it, I mean, they're not speculate, they're not trading on crypto markets. Let's put it like that. Um, but at the same time, they already are very, you know, crypto savvy, um, which, which, which makes them, you know, very interesting sort of like uh, counterparties. And also we realized that, you know, a, a lot of the crypto native, um, you know, uh, players in, in terms of a lot of the lenders, um, are also having an easier time to understand 
these type of players mm. um, versus Good point. Maybe a you know a company that that operates in emerging markets and and does like uh, you know loan for 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 um, yeah I mean, loans in in South America or something like that where which is sometimes a little bit of a uh, I would say far and distant world um, to a lot of the more crypto native lenders and crypto native yeah. users in general. I mean, I think to that end, like it's interesting. A lot of a lot of the time, like we just talk about, like the inherent product market fit mismatch between, um, you know, the potential lenders out there and and those that are that are looking to borrow. Like I think that'll kind of self correct over time as the industry progresses. But I think to your point, those those lenders for now are a little bit more crypto native, and so to the extent that they can assess borrowers that are in some way, shape or form directly in or like tangential to the ecosystem, it becomes much more palatable for them to like assess and have a view on, is this some, is this an opportunity that's interesting to me and, and potentially relevant to me? So I think that's a good point. Um, but I guess as you, as you look kind of down the line in terms of the future of Clearpool, do you see it can, again, kind of going back to like your experience throughout Asia, like, do you see an opportunity potentially for some of these um, like Asian fintech borrowers to kind of, you know, enter this ecosystem and leverage the, the clear pool protocol for this. And like, from, I guess, from your perspective, what do you think that looks like from a time, from a timeline standpoint? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, that, that, that is our goal. You know, we really want to create a marketplace with all type of uh, great opportunities. Um, and, and, and I guess, you know, us, you know, starting to work with those, you know, short term, um, you know, receivable financing payment firms is, is really just the first step. Um, but yeah, we do want to also offer, you know, other uh, type of credit opportunities and, and definitely a sort of like emerging market receivable financing loan, uh, l- l- loan is, is, is one of those, you know, opportunities that we want to uh, cater to. I think what is important is that, um, you offer something that is better than what's currently out there, right? Totally. Uh, Could not agree more. <laughs> yeah. Because, because, you know, let's, let's, I mean, you know, there's a lot of these like peer to peer, you know, funding platforms, et cetera. There's a lot of fintechs, right? Where, um, you know, you as a, as a, as a user, even as a small user, um, in the premise is similar to, 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 to crypto, right? You can just, you can, you can, you can actually deposit and you can, you can fund, um, you know, relatively small amounts, et cetera. A lot of those. Uh, so, so, so there is a lot of opportunities out there. I think the, the key really here is we need to launch something that makes it a better product than, um, that what is, that, that what's currently available, you know, in a fintech space. Um, because, you know, everything else equal. You know, do people really like to do things on chain versus just doing it, you know, off chain? I, I think we're not yet there, right? There's still a lot of. I mean, so happens. far it's more annoying. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. a lot right? of so, Yeah, if anything, you know, you'd be like, oh my god, I need to on ramp. I, I, you know, I have smart contract risk, I have stable, yeah. I have a lot of risks, right? So, so, so basically, the first answer was just like, oh, you know, you 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 do something exactly the same way as you do it in 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 in, in the traditional world, but then you know, obviously, there is like token incentives and all that kind of stuff. I think that is is slowly, you know, that has slowly uh, or it didn't stop, right? We're also still using it to some extent, but it's it's not as crazy as it used to be, right? Um, like back in the days where people were literally just 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 lending and just deploying because of the token incentives. The actual yield wasn't even relevant. Um, compared yeah. to those incentives, right? So I think that that is, uh, yeah, that, that that is not enough anymore. And and this is why, okay, you know, how is crypto, how is DeFi actually better? Yeah, as as I mentioned, um, transparency can be good, but then you know, you really need to have, um, you know, more transparency. If if it's just the, the funding of the loan repayment, that's probably not enough. Um, liquidity, and and then that's why where we come back to 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 what we discussed previously, right? If you're really able to create a product that is, you know, somehow more liquid. Um, you know, compared to a some, somehow more liquid, more efficient compared to, um, you know, doing any of those loans, um, in, in a traditional way, then I think that is very interesting. If you're able to really maybe sort of like unlock composability, um, you know, between different DeFi protocols, then that is also interesting, right? I think right now the problem with, with RWA and permission protocols is that, you know, they're all silos, right? The, yeah. the, the whole, the whole, um, you know, idea of, of, of composability and Lego blocks, et cetera, that doesn't really, um, isn't, isn't really valid, right? Because, 
you know, everyone has like their own sort of like, you know, compliance standards, their own KYC uh, partner, etc. So, so we really need to create a, a standard. Um, for, 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 for KYC, for transaction monitoring that, you know, all the different protocols uh, follow. And then, you know, it could be interesting because then you could really unlock a, a DeFi like, um, ecosystem, but with RWAs. And I think that's interesting, right? And I think we need to get there in order to really, um, you know, make that switch and people really, you know, kind of like move over and, 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 and use DeFi protocols uh, for this type of lending opportunities. Yeah, totally. I couldn't, I mean, I couldn't agree more. I think in terms of like what's precluding us as an industry from seeing that kind of vision, it's not, it's not a technological issue, right? It's more standards, regulation and and things that are um, seeing like a divergence in terms of the creation of all these like individual protocols and, and them not being composable again, not because they can't be technologically. It's just, you know, they have different standards and they have different um, kind of c- compliance teams. <laughs> so, yes, if, if you want, I'm happy to work with you on that initiative to make sure, uh, you know, we, we find a, a critical mass of, of protocols kind of aligned on, on similar terms, because I think that, you know, ultimately that's what we're all trying to get toward. Um, I guess my last question would be, and I'd be remiss not to ask this, I know Clearpool, you guys are on kind of a variety of different chains and, and your most um, kind of recent expansion, obviously, was to Avalanche with these credit vaults. Would love to kind of get a sense from your perspective in terms of what kind of informed your decision or led, led your decision in terms of um, kind of expanding to Avalanche and notably with the credit vaults. What, what did that look like? And, um, and then maybe we can wrap it up from there. Yeah, sounds good. Um, I think, I think so when we evaluate, first of all, right, we, we are on a few chains and I think, um, you know, that, that, that's definitely valuable. I, I am personally not like, I don't think there is a need for, you know, a thousand chains. Um, but, um, but, but, to but, the but choir. yeah, <laughs> but, 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 um, you know, um, obviously, obviously, um, I, I think, okay, so when we, when we evaluate new chains, um, you, we look at a couple of different things. So first of all, we realized that, um, you know, any sort of like, you know, smaller change that doesn't really have a lot of traction and liquidity, um, you know, usually it's going to be quite hard to, to find lenders and, and borrowers who are sort of willing to, to operate on that chain, even from a risk perspective. That, that's, that's been a little bit of a concern. Um, so, so, so obviously we need, you know, we, we evaluate chains that, that have a decent amount of liquidity. And, and a decent amount of sort of like traction and also track record. Um, also very important for chains to, to be supported by, you know, the, the, the main sort of like, um, uh, you know, exchanges or circle and, 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 and those kind of players and, and have native stable coins and, and et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, the, so if you, if you look at those sort of like requirements, then actually there is already not that many chains that are really, um, you know, relevant. There is, there's, there's not, that many, right? Um, so, so AVEX obviously, you know, f- falls into this. Um, and then, you know, I think what we really liked with Avalanche is that, you know, you guys have been a little bit, I would say, um, pioneers or trailblazers, <laughs> maybe. I like uh, it. Keep going. <laughs> in the, in the, in the sort of like RWA space, right? I guess you, you guys had a, a couple of very interesting sort of initiatives. Um, you know, you, you guys obviously also have the, Vista fund, I guess, right? That, 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 that looks at like different RWA, um, opportunities. Um, and, and, and then, you know, we kind of uh, really, we, we kind of thought and understood quite quickly that there is, um, you know, definitely a, 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 a solid sort of like, uh, I, I guess there's, there, there, there's a good match between what we're trying to do at Clearpool and the way that, you know, Avalanche is, 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 is seeing this space and the way that Avalanche is, um, sort of like driving RWA adoption forward. Um, and I guess, yeah, that's, that's also, um, because of your good job, I guess that's, that's, that's what you have been, uh, mainly driving at AVEX, right? So, so congrats on that. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so I guess, you know, we, we just launched with our first product and, uh, we are actually determined to, you know, now launch a couple of more, um, borrowers and even more borrower types, um, in, in the next uh, couple of weeks, months, uh, and they'll also be on, on, on AVEX. So, uh, you know, I feel we're just getting started. Um, and, and we're excited to be part of the ecosystem. Yeah, we're definitely excited to have you. And I think, I think part of the success that, um, you know, that, that we've had is I think we've never looked at 
like RWAs or the institutional world as like mutually exclusive from the DeFi world, right? Like there's definitely a place where they, those two worlds kind of intersect. And in that sense, you know, we, it, it's very much not me, right? It's me and, and the DeFi team and you know, so many others that are kind of working with partners like you guys to drive this space forward. So we don't, I don't think we look at these things as like siloed, siloed worlds. Um, and I think as the industry progresses, we'll actually start seeing um, these worlds almost colliding a lot more, a lot more than we think. So definitely excited to have you guys on board. And, and obviously, um, you know, it's been a pleasure working with you and, and look forward to, to continuing growing that out. Um, with that, I know we're almost at time. Um, Jacob, just wanted to kind of give you a chance. I, again, thank you so much for joining us, not only at um, like in the, almost the middle of your night, but also on a holiday. So thank you again. Um, but maybe wanted to turn it over to you for any, any final or parting thoughts and then we can, uh, we can wrap it up. Yeah, no, I think this was great. Thanks so much, Morgan, for, uh, for having me and, and the whole team at Avalanche. Um, I guess, yeah, today, obviously a bit of a, a red day. Um, uh, but you know, we, we, uh, you know, we are careful. We, we, we keep going. We're very determined to, to, to sort of, um, become the, the leading, um, you know, private credit, uh, platforms in the space. And, you know, I think, you know, keep watching us. We're going to have a lot of new, interesting, exciting lending opportunities. Um, and that, that we're going to launch with, uh, maybe like another thing that we're excited is, um, you know, next to, next to, next to fintechs, um, the next sort of like new borrower profile that we're launching are going to be the prime brokers. Um, so, 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 so we, are, we have a couple of interesting opportunities coming up there. So yeah, please follow us. And, and, uh, I think there's going to be a lot of exciting updates. Um, so much alpha around Clearpool <laughs> and AVEX. Cool. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Jacob. Really appreciate it. Um, just wanted to remind everyone, um, we will be releasing a replay of this session um, probably in the coming days. So if, if you missed out or if you joined late, um, definitely kind of t- tune into that. Um, I know Kyle always loves to put together some kind of summary bullets. Um, so look forward to that as well. Kyle, maybe let me hand it over to you um, to, to close it out. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Jacob. Lots of amazing information. Uh, like Morgan mentioned, we'll have the full recording up on YouTube in probably the next one or two days and then um, provide some summaries and clips and recaps so that folks that missed it or might have uh, missed part of it can can catch up. But we have information here at the top just about the credit pulse launch on Avalanche. And of course, you can go in there and uh, see uh, about that product, but also go to Clearpool's socials and website and really dive in and find out more. So yeah, go check it out after this. Jacob, once again, thanks for joining. Morgan, thanks for leading this forward. And we will uh, catch you all in the next Money Moves. So yeah. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye.